Well, today I'm going to continue on in the sermon series on why bother with church. Now, different churches get a reputation for different things, especially in larger centers where there's a church down every road and, you know, there's a lot of variety here in our small community. There's not an awful lot of variety of churches, so we, you know, don't have the same kinds of dynamics as in larger centers but i grew up in a larger center and the church i went to was called christian life assembly in langley bc so it was a church of about 2,000 people when i was growing up later on it grew to about three and then later to four thousand people as god blessed and uh, our church was known for two things. Basically, uh, it was known for its music. And if you go on, online and look up Christian Life Assembly in Langley, you'll see they've you know, made some CDs and stuff like that. And it was not just any music. They were into gospel, like black gospel music. How many of you like black gospel music? Yeah, black gospel is, is kind of like what uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sings. So we had this great big choir and, you know, just, we had a Hammond organ and, you know, we would just rock the place. It was pretty cool. And actually both Shelly and I were in that choir when uh, we were first married and Julia was in Shelly's womb when, she, Julia, when Shelly was in the choir and Julia used to just rock out in the womb during the choir rehearsals and uh, music has stuck with her to this day. She just loves music. So that was the one thing that we were known for. The second thing that we were known for was young adults. We had piles and piles of young adults. So we actually had more young adults in our young adult services on Friday nights than what we have in our church here. So it was amazing. So those were the two big things that we were known for. Um, and people came to our church for both of those reasons and probably others too, but those were the kind of the main ones. Then there was other churches in town. There was one church in town. I remember their reputation was that was the businessman's church. So if you were a businessman, that's where you needed to go because they hung out all in that church and I don't know if they'd make business deals there or if they, you know, networking or whatever it was, but they all just sort of huddled together in that one area. And, and then, you know, there's all kinds of other things that churches get known for. Some of them are good reasons uh, to be attracted to a church. Others, others of them are not necessarily good reasons to be attracted to a church. Um, but there are a lot of good reasons to bother with church. Last week we talked about, you know, the love that you feel in a church. Um, today I want to talk about the possibility that being part of a church actually could make you a better person. Now, I'm not saying that as a definitive statement that being part of a church will make you a better person. I'm saying it possibly could make you a better person. And as we go along, you'll see why I'm not so absolute on that statement. The truth is, we all want to be good people. I mean, deep down inside, I think that's a generally a good thing. Uh, and a generally an accepted thing. I mean, most of us, when we meet each other, put our best foot forward because we want to be known as a good person. We don't go around saying, you know, well, I'm a lousy, you know, this, and I'm a lousy that, and I'm a lousy this, and, and so on. We, we try to think of ourselves as good people, and we try to present ourselves as good people, and I think that's a good thing. And being a good person, if going to church could help you with that, maybe that's worthwhile then. I think churches possibly could help us instill good values in ourselves and in our kids. 
Sometimes I worry about families who don't bring their kids to church and how that can affect their kids. You know, the parents might have a vibrant faith, but if you take away the community of faith, you know the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. If you take away that village of faith, which a church can be, that can be a scary thing in a child's life. And, and I would probably venture to say that if that was all that you got out of church, that would probably still be worth it to get up on Sunday mornings, make your way down, and be part of it. But, if that's all you got out of church, you would have missed the very best part. And the very best part of church is actually a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the key to all of what we are about. He is central to everything. So I want to look at a passage in a book in the New Testament called Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, and starting in verse 6, it says, But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So that's a key phrase right there. I want you to remember that. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. So, to understand this, the backstory is that God had a very long process in his plan for mankind. So, he started with one nation, the Israelites. And he developed a process with them but whereby they could deal with their sins on a short term or a temporary basis. So he made all these rules and rituals and, and uh, sacrifices and things like that that they could follow, which would give them temporary relief for their mistakes. And they had to repeat them. Every time they made a mistake, they had to go through the process again. And then they, you know, it was rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, over and over again. This was the way they set it up. And, and it, it was just a, it was never meant to be a permanent situation. It was always intended to just be a temporary thing until Jesus came. But basically, what it was, was it was... Uh, it was to help the Israelis prove to themselves that they couldn't live up to the standard of universal goodness. So this ties back to what we talked about a second ago about everybody deep down inside wants to be a good person. So they wanted to be good people. So he gave them this temporary covenant or process by which they could try to prove that they were good people. 
But God knew all along that they would never be able to live up to that standard. None of us can live up to the standard of universal goodness. As much as we want to try, we just can't do it. And so, basically what God did was he... He almost, it was almost like with a stubborn child, you know, when a parent t says to their child, okay then, knock yourself out, try to do it yourself. How many of you had, had ch children who, you know, wanted to feed themselves or change their own diaper or, you know, do something like that and they were stubborn and they wanted to, you know, prove that they could do it and so finally as a parent you go, okay then, Show me. Show me that you can do it. And, you know, they try, and of course they completely mess up, and then finally they, you know, eat humble pie, maybe eat a few other things, and they realize that, you know, there's a sense that maybe I do need mom and dad. And... You know, some of us probably did that later on in life too. You know, when we were 18 and 19, we told our parents, you're just old and don't have a clue and I don't need you. And we figured we could figure it all out on our own. And then when we got to 25, 26, 28, we realized actually mom and dad are pretty smart and I probably should listen to them and so on and so forth. Well, it was the same kind of thing here with the Israelis. God basically said, okay, okay, Knock yourself out, try to do good, and if you, you know, once you're ready, I'm here waiting to help you. And basically, they tried as hard as they possibly could, and they never were able to achieve it. Now, the interesting thing is, today, we go about it in a different way in our culture. We try redefining goodness to fit into where we are at. And so we go, well, my truth is different than your truth. So, you know, I think I'm a good person because I live this way and, you know, you can be a good person on your, your terms and, you know, it's all good. And so we try to redefine basically on our own terms what goodness is. And, you know, we can fool ourselves for a while into thinking that maybe we are so smart and we've got it all together and we truly are good people. But the truth is, when it boils right down to it, if my goodness is different than your goodness, and then we have to figure out who is ethically right or wrong in any given situation, we are stuck if we don't have a higher authority somewhere along the way of what goodness really is. And so we need God. And you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that basically we're in trouble by the, going down the road we're going. The Jews went about it a little bit differently. They decided, well, instead of redefining truth, we're just going to add more rules to what God has already given us. So they actually kept adding more and more and more rules, thinking that the more rules we have, the better people we are. So they ended up actually with 613 rules. And they still couldn't follow the rules. Actually, the truth is, the more rules they had, the more they messed up on the rules. And so they ended up in a situation where they're basically stuck. And... Let's face it, this is exactly what every religious system does. It creates a definition of what goodness looks like, sets up rules and rituals and so on around that, and then tells you to work hard to live up to that. And it never works. And that's why so many people have given up on organized religion. Because it's just frustrating. You just can't do it. And you end up feeling less than you did to start with. So why bother with it? But here is where Jesus entered the picture. See, Jesus came and changed everything. See, when Jesus came, he basically said two things. He said, stick with me and I will take care of all of your past, 
and stick with me and I will change your future. Those are the two key things that Jesus basically said in the New Covenant. Stick with me and I'll take care of your past. And Jesus basically, what he did is he paid for all of our mistakes. So we'd racked up this massive debt and Jesus said, okay, I will take care of that debt. I'll pay it all off for you. How many of you have a mortgage on your house? Just imagine with me for a minute, somebody comes along and says, I'm going to pay your mortgage off today. I actually heard about that happening. Um, I may have even talked about that. Um, Donald Trump was out in his limousine one day and he got a flat tire and somebody stopped to help him. Uh, and he was so grateful, he said, uh, you know, can I have your contact info? And they said, oh, sure. And they gave him the contact info. And the next day he sent flowers to the lady and then he sent a little note in the flowers. And he said, uh, by the way, I uh, paid off your mortgage for you on your house. Well, that would be a nice payoff for helping somebody with a flat tire. Can you imagine? Well, that's exactly what Jesus did for us at a spiritual level. We had all kinds of issues that we couldn't deal with no matter how hard we tried. And Jesus said, okay, don't worry about it. I've got this. And he paid for the whole thing. All of it was wiped right out. The past completely taken care of. And some people believe that that's all there is to this walk of faith in Jesus. That he pays for your past so that you can have a clean slate. But if that's all there is to this walk with Jesus and all you've experienced, you've missed out on a massive part of this. Because Jesus didn't just talk about our past, he talked about our future as well. And he said, if you walk with me, I will change your future. I will transform the way you live your life. And you will be able to, be able to live a life that really works. Now, different people have defined that in different ways. You know, some people have said, well, that means you're going to be wealthy. I don't necessarily think Jesus meant that because there's lots of people that really walk closely with Jesus in all kinds of parts of the world that aren't wealthy. There's some people that said, well, that means that you're always going to be healthy. I've known some people that were really, really godly people that weren't healthy physically. But I do believe that when Jesus says, I'm going to give you a life that works, he means that he's going to teach us how to think about life in such a way that we have genuine joy, genuine peace, genuine love, and that is what makes life work, irregardless of what your circumstances are. And the thing is, it's a slow process. And this is where, we talked a little bit about this last Sunday as well. I mean, I wish that we had a magic wand that we could just wave over people the moment they prayed their very first prayer and it would completely change their minds and they would live completely happy from that moment forward. But it doesn't work that way. We saw in, this verse, in these verses that we read here that he said he's going to write his laws in our heart. That happens one law at a time. It's not like he instantly, bam, it's all there. He's constantly writing and explaining and changing our thinking one little bit at a time. And so it goes, takes time. And that's one of the things that we in our culture today don't do well with. We're into the instant thing. You heard about the little boy who looked at the thing that said instant, uh, you know, instant food and he was going to put it in the microwave. I don't know if it was a Pop-Tart or something like that. And he looked at it and it, it said on there, put in the microwave for two minutes. And he's like, two minutes? I thought this was instant. We don't do well with the, you know, patiently waiting for processes nowadays. We want everything bang, 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 instant, yesterday preferably. But with 
the transformation of our minds that Jesus promised to do, it actually takes time. And I think this is important for us to understand when we are introducing people to Jesus. This is a long-term relationship, a long-term commitment. You're not going to instantly see massive change. It's going to be a process over time. And over the years, you're going to notice that things are changing more and more. So, as he writes these things in our hearts, that, it stands to reason that we have to learn to listen. So, how do we listen Jesus. to Jesus? That's one of the key questions that we as believers need to come to grips with. How do we hear what he is trying to teach us as he's transforming our minds? Well, I submit to you, one of the ways is through the Bible. That's one of the reasons why we have a Bible reading plan here. It's one of the reasons why I every day start my day with the Word of God, the Bible. Because it's so important for us to be able to hear God through that. I think another way is through prayer. And that's why it's, I encourage you to take time every day to pray, just to listen to God. Not to rattle off a you know, grocery list of requests, but to listen to Him in your, excuse me, in your heart of hearts. To say, God, what do you have to say to me about what's going on in my life right now? And sometimes God speaks to us through other people as well, through preachers, through people in our small groups. That's one of the reasons why we have small groups in our church, because I believe that God gives everybody something that is valuable to the other people around them. And so we need each other in that environment. And over time, we begin to think completely different. I want to look at one more verse here. In John chapter 10, it says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So here it's Jesus talking, and he is contrasting two different types of lives. He two extremes, if you will. One where you're being robbed where you're losing out constantly, and the other one where you have a rich and satisfying life. Now, I submit to you that a religious life, and there are Christians that live their lives in very religious ways, too, that robs you. It diminishes your life. It causes you to be poorer and causes you to live a life of spiritual poverty. And after a while, it leaves a bitter taste in your life, in your mouth, spiritually. And if you've lived in a, in a highly legalistic, religious kind of environment, whether it was a Christian church or some other kind of religious community, I... I don't blame you if you feel like, well, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. I don't think Jesus wants you to have anything to do with that. And that's exactly what had happened to the Jews. And Jesus came to change all of that, to give them life to the fullest. And there's all kinds of of ways in which we still to this day get hung up in rules and rituals and religious activity, even inside of Christian churches. And I believe Jesus comes and says, ah, oh, get rid of all of that. I just want a loving relationship with you. That's the key thing. That's really what this is all about. And... And see, that is what leads to a genuinely rich life. See, because Jesus comes in like a personal mentor, and he, he moves right into our hearts. So he's always with us, everywhere we go, willing to give us guidance, advice. He's willing to teach us. 
Now, the thing is, it's not easy to hear his voice when in an information overload kind of society like we live in, where we're being bombarded with information from every direction all the time. It takes intentionality to quiet ourselves down on the inside to be able to hear from God. And if we can't do that, we probably won't be able to actually hear what he's saying. So I encourage you, find time every day to just be quiet. Now, it might drive you crazy to start with, but it is really important if you want to be transformed in your thinking by Jesus. And it'll mean more, more self-awareness in the process. You'll become more aware of what's going on on the inside of yourself as you go through this process. And as you become more self-aware, more God-aware, you'll be also become aware of the pathway to inner freedom. And see, this is the thing. Religious activity makes us look good on the outside, but leaves us empty on the inside. A relationship with Jesus fills us on the inside, but may not necessarily make us look as perfect on the outside. And God talks about that. Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. It's so important for us to, to understand that. So why bother with church? Well, the truth is, if you do it right, by focusing on Jesus, it will change your life. You will become a better person. You will become a good person that's cha changed in the way you think. And what that looks like is thriving. You will thrive on the inside. That is what Jesus is after. But Dallas, I know that that may be what Jesus wants, but the truth is I think it's actually easier to thrive outside the church than it is inside the church. Because inside the church there's so many hypocrites and so many people that just make it difficult. I think it's easier to thrive when I just leave church alone. And you've heard me say this before, but when people tell me, you know, I don't want to go to church because it's just a bunch of hypocrites, I tell them, don't worry about that. Just come on out. One more won't make any difference. <laughs> and the truth is, if you're talking about a church that's very religious with lots of rules and rituals and stuff like that, yeah, it probably won't lead to you thriving. But if you can find a church that's genuinely committed to Jesus, that's following Jesus, that's encouraging you to seek Jesus, to listen to Jesus, and has Jesus at the center of everything, it will lead to a life that's thriving. And it is the best place possible to help you move in that direction. Because when you're surrounded by other people that are following Jesus, it reinforces that same journey in you. And why is this? Well, you see, rules lead, they, they come out of fear. And fear never leads to thriving. But love leads to thriving. And Jesus is all about love. Jesus' love is what transforms us. And this is why God had to replace the old covenant like we saw there, because that was a lot of fear there, with the new covenant that was based on love. Two commandments, love God, love your neighbor in the new covenant. And, and over time, that will lead us to genuinely thriving. So I want to introduce you to Leah this morning. Leah grew up in a very dysfunctional family. And she left home at 17 years old. By 18 years old, she was pregnant, she was all alone, and she was broke. And she met a friend 
who said to her, well, why don't you come with me to church? And this was Leah's response. Church has got to be the very last place on earth I would ever want to go now. The last thing I need now is more people waving their finger at me going, what on earth have you done? Now, obviously, Leah had an experience of church that is not at all in line with the way Jesus wants us to experience him. It was completely out of line with Jesus' way of relating to others. I heard, heard something the other day that, that really caught my attention. It was actually from a parenting thing. And the, this is the thing. It, it asked the question, when your kids mess up, is their first reaction, oh, don't tell mom and dad whatever you do. I don't want them to know. Or is their first reaction, oh, I better talk to mom and dad about this so they can help me figure this out. See, one is based on fear, the other one is based on love. When you fear somebody, you don't you want to keep it secret, you don't want them to know, you just want to keep, you know, keep them out of the loop. But when you love someone and you feel them loving you, the first thing you want to do is invite them into your mess to help you figure it out. And that's the way God is. And that's the way God wanted Leah to respond when when, when Leah got her life all mix, messed up, if she had really understood who God was, like if she had been part of a church that really got this thing about Jesus, her response was, yes, please, can I go to church? I need help trying to figure this out. But when they... But, but when, when we have a wrong understanding of Jesus and God, we want to keep God out of, out of our problems, out of our life. This is the good news, folks. There's lots and lots of people right here in White Court who have a view of God that's like, no, 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 don't tell God. Just keep Him out of this. And our, our good news for them is, no, 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 you've misunderstood who God is. The first thing you want to do now is go to God because He wants to help you figure this out. And that is the attitude of someone who is genuinely loved.